Right, so I am going to attempt to, to lay some stone with a head cam on my head, which I haven't done before, but I hope you kind of get the idea of what I'm doing. You can see that I've completed a couple of the walls now, and the eagle-eyed amongst you might notice that this looks a little bit different from the original video, uh, and that's because, unfortunately, I had to position one of my strings a few inches out, and I wasn't happy with the overhang on the coping stones, so I removed the stone wall that I'd built and rebuilt it, so that set me back half a day. So now as a result, I've got the original um, sort of base lip here, and then I've got a slightly smaller one above it before I then reach up to the wall. But that works quite nicely all the way around. So I've got all the tools I need to hand. I've got my trowels, my mallets, a bucket of muck that I've pre-mixed. I've got my gazebo above me because it's a bit windy and a bit, a bit threatening today, and you might not be able to hear me over the wind noise, but bear with me. So this is how I'm laying the stonework. I've got a good selection of rock around me, everything to hand so I don't have to keep climbing in and out of the pond because that's always frustrating. And then it's about selecting pieces of stone that I like the look of. Now, it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. Of course, this is underwater. It's not really gonna be that noticeable if a, an edge isn't completely square or a stone isn't completely level. However, now is the time to get it right, so you wanna do your best. I'll be raking out the joints in a couple of hours once the cement has had a, a little time to go off. It's amazing actually how much stone and how much muck you end up using on jobs like this. I mean, this isn't too big a gap at the back, but if there was quite a lot of space, I'd be back filling with bits of rubble and, and um, you know, bits of hardcore as well. Quite often there's bits of leftover stuff on the job, so it's a good way of losing it. You can see that I've got secondary pieces of liner, liner off cuts here, which I'm positioning on top of the main pond liner to protect it, that's really important. Uh, and this is the old piece of pond liner, which I've reclaimed and uh, just got rid of some of the muck and just sort of chopped it up. And that does the job. When you're building something like this, it's totally random. So it's just finding something you like the look of and going with it. I've set up some strings, not not for much, not so much for the levels, but just to give me a straight line to work towards. That makes it an awful lot easier visually to, to have a reference. But at the same time, the strings do get in the way and you've got to be careful not to keep knocking them. But it's handy to have. <clears throat> and this principle is exactly the same if you were laying, you know, bigger, blockier natural pieces of stone. The stonework will be sat inside the pond on this shelf or if you're building up, you know, walling like this with brickwork or blockwork, natural stone. Same sort of formula, same principle applies. And this template then works, you know, well with any sort of pond design. What you want to try and do is to span the joints. Not always. Sometimes, if you've got a big chunky stone like this one here, you're going to end up having a, you know a couple of areas of of stone on top of each other like this. But for the majority of the walling, for the structure, and also for the aesthetics, it looks nice if you can span those those joints, bridge them across with some some longer stones like this. Um, and as I said before, I'm always looking to leave gaps, nooks and crannies and little caves, because if I was a frog, I would love to go and hide in there. Now 
Now you could do this, completely dry stone. I have built ponds dry stone before, and I have to say it's a darn sight quicker as well. But structurally, it's nice to have something that you know that isn't going to isn't going to move. And actually, it's it's quite nice to have the muck to hand because it's a great way of, of helping to, to pack out and level out stones without looking for thin little you know chippings that you have to wedge underneath. And although this cement looks quite obvious now because it's fresh and it's quite dark and a different colour, once you've raked it out and it's dried, it's almost unnoticeable. And again, particularly once that's underwater, it's going to be very discreet. to have a selection of different size trowels. Particularly fond of these these sort of fine micro pointing tools. And I've got some here. I mean this one I've had for such a long time I've I've really worn it down. Once upon a time it would have been square and then over use it sort of rounded off the edge and now you can see how that's really sort of rounded down. But this is fantastic. It's lovely for scraping out and lovely for creating a nice a nice fine um, sort of point inside a small gap. So really hang on to these when they get to that sort of state. Likewise with levels, you want to have a selection of different sizes. I've got a six foot here, a four foot, a two foot, and then a much smaller sort of scaffolding level. And they're all useful to have. I've got a tape measure to hand as well, because I'm always, as I go, just checking to make sure that my lip, the sort of shelf, the step, I'll get there in the end, is about the sort of same size. So a combination of the strings the level, the tape measure, it's just making sure that as I'm going everything is sort of straight and true or as good as. I'm using quite a dry mix, certainly drier than you'd have for, for brick laying. And this is a, a four to one mix, three parts builder sand, one part sharp sand and one part cement and I like it a little bit drier it's, it's sort of sticky it doesn't fall off the trowel but it's less likely to stain the stonework as well Just reaching an area which doesn't have any line of protection. It's an awkward area because I don't want to disturb my string. So I'll just place that there. At least it's in position. Now this, these corners aren't even going to be noticed. They're going to be underneath gravel because these are going to be planted up. So you can be less than perfect around here. It's very useful having a long level or any sort of long straight edge so that as you go, again, you've got a, another reference point right in front of the, the stonework. Right, well, I shall carry on few more days and I'll get the bulk of this done.
you can see that I've done most of the, the four sides here. I've got my strings up to get another very important reference point when you're trying to do straight lines and, uh, and 90 degree bends. It's actually surprisingly difficult to, um, to create a square or a rectangle and try to remain true. I'm at the stage now where I'm building in conduits and inlets and outlets for the system. So you can see over here, this is going to be the feature wall where the um, stainless steel water blade is going to sit. And I've now fixed a bracket for, for the light. I want the light to be central to the blade so that it illuminates that curtain of water as it falls out. And there will also be a, um, a, an LED light integrated into the water blade as well. One of these pipes is the feed to the blade. And the other one here is a conduit to allow the cable for the water blade um, LED light cable. Now, unfortunately, the LED light has a two pin adapter on the end, which is quite large. So you have to use quite a bulky conduit to be able to get that cable through. But that means that in the future, if we have to replace the light, we haven't got to dismantle the stonework. We can just feed a new cable through and, uh, and replace that light quite easily. Over here, we've got Another conduit, this is going to be access for feeding through the, the submersible uh, transformer for the lighting kit. That's one, one cable going through and there will also be the pond pump. That's another cable going through. This one here is going to be a bypass, a return from the filtration system. If ever we want to turn off the water blade, we can still keep the life support running and the water will discharge back into the pond via this. And we can also use this as a, a very effective way of calibrating and controlling the flow coming out of the blade by a simple Y valve with two taps outside of the pond. One Y going to the water blade and the other section of that Y coming to the discharge here. I can, I can use this as a bleed essentially, turning down the, the flow to the blade if needs be, but still ensuring I've got the full flow of the pump and the full circulation going through the pond. So that's always a really handy thing to have. And then lastly, this is the the inlet to the filtration system. This is the, the section that the pump will be connected to. And that will be concealed because there's gonna be four diagonal planters built into each corner. So this section here, most of that will be concealed and there's just enough pipe left so that the pump can be lifted clean, proud of the surface, taken to one side for maintenance. That's very important. It will be nice to leave it, you know, very short aesthetically, uh, but it's gonna make maintenance all but impossible in the future. So it's, it needs to be practical. So I've got a little way to go, a fair amount of stonework still to lay, but I'm getting above the waterline now and it's going to start getting exciting. Another day or two when I can get the pond filled up, I can get a proper idea of the, of the levels, um, and then I can start to, to build the feature wall and the water blade. Well, the water depth has increased today. I've put about another foot of water into the pond so I can start to gauge the levels and get an idea of exactly where the stonework and the contours are um, sitting in relation to water level. The pond itself has still got another foot, 10 inches or so, before it reaches maximum level, but it's giving me an idea now of, of how accurate I've been. I'm at the stage where I'm starting to, to trim pond liner. This is something that you wanna leave till, you know, as late as possible in the in the stage of building a pond. Um, when you first lay the liner and put some water in the pond, you can give it a, a cursory sort of trim just to get rid of the big overlaps. But you don't want to do anything too drastic until you know um, that you've reached maximum water line and that you don't want to go any deeper. Because once you cut it off, of course, it's, you can't put it back, it's too late. Now I'm, I'm trimming away the liner so I can reveal the, the brick wall behind this because I'm starting to build up what will be the, the slightly higher feature wall, which is going to take the stainless steel um, water blade. Um, I'm leaving a slight overlap of, of pond liner here, but I want to make sure that the stonework and the, and the render is in direct contact with the brick so that it can adhere you know, properly to a rough surface. I'm still using sort of thinner cut stone pieces, but in places I'm going to use larger stones that will span both the natural stone and the brickwork, and this will help to tie in um, both surfaces together. Unfortunately, the weather forecast is forecast some thunderstorms, and it looks like one is brewing. I can hear a few rumbles in the distance, and I'm aware that standing in a pond is probably not the best place to be during a, a thunderstorm. Um, I'm hoping my trusty rubber waders will serve me good here. So it's another day. The pond is really starting to come together now. Um, I've started to tackle some of the the top edging coping stone and it's uh, it's very satisfying to start to get to the sort of finished 
surface. I mean, it's going to look so much better, obviously, when the, when the slabs are raised up to the correct level and pointed in. But you can really start to get the idea now, and I can really see sort of the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, got to raise up the area behind the pond liner on this side and start to build up a secondary sort of smaller retainer before I can start to lay the edging stones. So that's today's job. And then finally, I can tackle the feature wall and the stainless steel reel. Now I've left this, or water blade I should say, I've left that to the very end because obviously the blade has to be absolutely central to that back wall. And if it's out even just an inch or two, it's, it's gonna, you know, gonna be noticeable. And before I can get an absolute idea of what's gonna be central, uh, what it's going to be central to, of course, when you're looking at it, is the, the surface coping stones. So I've got to wait until I've got stones either side before I can really gauge what the centre is going to be. So once I've got the edging stones built up all around here underneath the Acer, I can start to, to tackle that, and that's going to be the fun bit. And then from there, it'll be plain sailing, building up the planters around the edges. And then the pond drained, cleaned, refilled and off we go. It's doing jobs like this where I really get to appreciate nature and I've just found this fantastic male stag beetle, absolutely gorgeous. Well, it's another couple of days since my last post and progress is, is coming on nicely with the pond. So you can see all the stonework around the edge of the pond has been completed up above water level and what will be eventually the, the finished edging level. I've cut and positioned just dry at the moment all of the Indian sandstone slabs just to, to get an idea about what that's going to look like. And I'm now starting to complete the feature wall at the back there. The base of it's in place and rendered and then the top section here is just sort of dry stone at the moment just so I can get an idea of height. Um, I've positioned the stainless steel water blade just so I can get an idea of, of height elevation from the blade to the surface of the pond. The pond itself still isn't completely full we've got about another three or four inches of water to go before it's at its maximum and I think that I would probably want to lift that blade a few inches higher um, just to create a, a nice visual effect. This is a 600 mil water blade and I think you want to have a fall of at least half of the width of the blade so a 600 mil blade a 300 mil drop. Um, a drop up to the width of the, the blade works okay, 600, but much further than that and the nice um, sort of film of water starts to, to cross and you lose that nice effect, so you don't want to go too high with it. Now if you can see this in the shade of my gazebo, because it's 30 degrees today, the hottest day of the year so far, you can see here this is the Awaza stainless steel water blade and this is the what's called the extended lip or the XL version. So the standard water blade has got a much, much smaller lip, um, about this sort of size, and then the extended lip extends that slightly. For this sort of use, you always want to use an extended lip, and for a couple of reasons. One, you don't want that film of water to be too close to the, to the back wall, to the wall of the pond, um, because you end up with a permanent sort of unsightly green patch of algae or, or a brown slimy patch where the wall is permanently damp. So you want to be able to project that water a little bit further into the pond to prevent that. And the other thing is that unless you're tiling and you're using very, very thin um, tiles to, to stick in front of the blade to conceal it, without the extended lip, you haven't got enough depth here to be able to get a suitable amount of stone or brick in front of and behind the blade to conceal it. So the extended lip here works perfectly. I've got about a brick width either side, so I'll be able to put a nice thick amount of stone over the top. I'll be using a simple, angle iron lintel over the top of this which is discreet and it'll allow me to continue stonework over the top of this as well and uh, I'll crack on. So here's a closer look of the Awaza stainless steel water blade. It's a very nice well well put together piece of kit uh, and inside here there's some some internal baffles that have been incorporated into this to ensure that the water flow has been sort of slowed down and evenly distributed over the top of this so you create that lovely unbroken film of water. So you've got options here of having uh, a bottom entry or a rear entry, and that can't be said without a smile. Um, supplied with a blanking end cap so that you can close off whichever aperture you're not using, and then a hose tail with a flat seal as well. 
Now I'm using inch and a quarter heavy duty hose here, so it's important that the hose tail has been cut down to the suitable size. Um, it would allow three quarter inch, one inch, inch and a quarter, an inch and a half increment hosing. Uh, and always standard practice with a hose tail that you always want to cut down to ensure that you're not reducing the flow and putting any restrictions on. So that's been cut down. I've put the blanking cover in, uh, and I've also just put a little bit of um, wet water sticky stuff, a bit of pond sealant on the threads just to make sure that that's properly sealed. Obviously this is not going to be particularly accessible, so a bit of belt and braces just to make sure there's no potential for any leaks. Um, and likewise, when I secure the hose tail to the base of this, um, although it will be a perfectly watertight seal with the, the flat seal against this nice stainless steel surface, I will also put a little bit of, um, of sealant on the threads. You could use a bit of sealant, you could use a bit of liquid PTFE, um, but I prefer to use the, you know, a little bit of pond sealant on here just to make sure that that's a nice watertight finish. So I need to continue building up the, the stonework on the base here, on the back, um, and it's important that I'm very thoughtful and cautious as I go. Um, I don't want to cut this pipe off until the very, very last possible moment so I can decide then exactly what height that, that water blade is going to sit at because of course once I've cut it um, it's going to be quite difficult to try and join onto that um, with the stonework etc all around it. Well this is the water blade's first proper wet test and it's very important that you do this before you totally encase it in stonework just to make sure that there are no problems with potential leaks, overflow, uh, making sure the conduit is in the correct position for the cable etc. But this is all running really nicely. So obviously it's essential when you're rigging one of these up that it's absolutely level. Um, and I wanted to maintain water flowing over this blade whilst I'm building up the stonework around the outside of it, just to make sure that, you know, I've got a really good visual indicator that there's nothing moving and that everything is, is operating as it should do. This pump is a little bit too powerful. This is an 8,000 uh, litre per hour pump and the recommended flow rate for this blade is approximately 6,000 litres per hour. And you can see that the, the water is bubbling up a little high here and the margins for potential leak are not great. Now, if there were to be a buildup of blanket weed or, or some other sort of film on here which would cause the water to back up behind it. There's only about five mil or so of, of clearance here before that would leak. So it's important that you choose the right size pump. Now once I reduce this flow down, this will drop down significantly um, and there'll be no issues at all there. As the pump itself is pumping through a filtration system, that's going to reduce the flow. But if needs be, I've got a separate entrance into the pond which I can use as a bleed so that I can turn this pump down, get the water blade calibrated to the correct flow. But it's coming on nicely, so I'm going to continue to build up the stonework around this now and encase it. I've got a lintel to go over the top of this so that I can incorporate a couple of courses of stone um, above the, the water blade. And then I've got this section pretty much finished. It's a lovely effect, it's a lovely sound, it's nice and soft without being too, too invasive. It's going to be great having the light up here behind the film of water. 